Good morning, Community Church. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you all here this morning. And if you're joining us online, uh, we are so glad to have you with us this morning. We will be uh, having two special things today. One of them is a baptism of one of our newer members of the Covenant family. And we're going to welcome uh, young Reese into the Covenant family of grace as we celebrate his baptism this morning. Uh, if you're new here, we're so glad to have you, and we pray that the Lord would bless you by your first time here with us. If, you're been, if you've been around for a long time, then look for those new folks and welcome them and greet them in the Lord. Uh, also, I want to just encourage you that we will be also celebrating communion today. And I want to remind everyone, communion is where we celebrate the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and also his promise that he is coming again. And so in doing so, this communion that we'll celebrate, not the, not the grapes and the, and the little jug there, but the stuff behind there, the communion that we will celebrate is one for all those who are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ and put their faith in him alone for their salvation. So we encourage you to consider during this time where you are in your walk with the Lord, pray for forgiveness for sins, ask for a spirit of rep repentance, and also seek him in this time because this is a powerful time of God's presence with us. Uh, if you'd like to know some more information about uh, the church and our activities this next week and going beyond, turn to the second to last page and you'll see a lot of announcements. We've got many different activities going on. Uh, but one of the things I wanted to let you know, today is the last day to sign up for t-shirts. I know some of you are like, darn. Um, what I'd like you to do is there, there are still some more uh, handouts out in the foyer, out in the, what we call the narthex. You can grab one of those, fill out, fill out your uh, order, and also put it into Debbie Laro's box. You can see all those little mailboxes out there. Other than that, I believe it is time to celebrate the Lord, but wait one, th one thing more. I wanted to let you know that there is a special event going on for ladies coming up May 24th. And that is the Canvas and Community get-together, an opportunity to paint together a very pretty painting, which is out in the narthex as well. You guys ready to worship? Yes. yes. All right. That's, that's almost there. Are you guys ready to worship? Yes. Amen. All right. Let's pray. Father, we come into this place and time to worship and glorify you, to love you and to love one another, and then to go forth and love our neighbors. So, Lord, equip us in this time as we read through the scriptures, as we study and learn it together, as we sing praises unto your name, O God. We remind ourselves that this time is not for us. This time is for you and that you would be blessed. So focus our hearts, our minds upon you, and let us sing, let us praise, let us pray with joy unto our Savior and King, the Lord Jesus Christ. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Just checking to see if you're in your blocks ready to run the race of this worship service this morning. I told this before, those of you who have been in um, track, track meets and so forth, especially the runners, <clears throat> you're on the blocks. There's a little butterfly in your stomach because you're waiting for the gun to go off. And when it goes, you fly. You fly. Whether you come in first, second, or last, the fun of running is great. So uh, as we approach this service, we have a greeting, an ancient greeting, the Lord be with you and also with you. But be ready for the first hymn, which is in the red hymnal, a little bit later, right after the, uh, the Apostles' Creed. So stand together and let's greet one another as the leaders lead, the Lord be with you and you answer. The Lord be with you.
Good morning, Community Church. This morning's scripture reading is from Galatians 5. 16 through 25, and it's titled, Keep in Step with the Spirit. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, Against such things, there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Will you pray with me? Father in heaven, Lord, we come here this morning desiring to worship you and glorify you. I pray that each one of us here will sense your spirit among us. May your spirit do a work here, that you might lead us, you might help us dive into your word, that it would impact our lives in a way that we can't help but take it from here and help further your kingdom as you see fit. Lord God, as we worship your name this morning, may your spirit lead us and guide us. And may we understand that you are the reason we are here. Pray your word is heard and applied every day. Lord God, we ask all these things in the name of Christ. Amen. I was stricken with the part in Galatians where it says, For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. You've heard this before. 18-month-old grandson years ago crosses the barrier, crosses a, the, he does something wrong. Braylon, I'm putting you in your crib and I'll be back in two and a half minutes and I want to know what the issue is. Tick, tick, tick. Come in. He's pawing the mattress of his crib. Okay, I'm waiting for the issue. Well, Papa, the issue is I just want to do what I want to do. 18 months, so it goes way back, and it still goes on with us, right? So let's stand together and declare what we believe and mean it. Stand together, the Apostles' Creed. And the people of God said together, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, 
and in Jesus Christ, the only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from whence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. I'll hail the power of Jesus' name, number 326 in the red hymnal. Together, let's sing. Please remain standing if you're able. <clears throat> Your hand, O oh God, is guided. One church, one faith, one Lord. Oh. 
Amen. Be seated, please. From the Blue Psalter, Psalm 128C, which is page 845. You get to see a lot more when the Psalter's open than just the text. I can't say enough for this piece. And it's really moving us into the baptism of Reese and remembrance of our own baptisms. We all have uh, families, we have struggles. This speaks to that. It also talks about the children and those beyond and praying that we will see our children's heirs. So let's sing together this wonderful text paraphrased from Psalm 128. Community Church, this is uh, one of those very special times as we get to welcome a child of the covenant by the sacrament of baptism. Here at, uh, here at Community EPC, we celebrate baptism of the children of the church. As we read in the scriptures, even today, Stephanus's whole family, his whole household was baptized, and that included the children and uh, this happened many times as we look at the book of Acts. So what we want to do is we want to welcome Reese Atlas Bolzman and his mother and father, Grace and Philip, to come up here with me and join me in this opportunity. Look, he looks so excited, just like all of us. As you both come up here, okay, we've got too many hands here. I'm going to borrow your table here, brother, ever so slightly. Thank you. Okay. Wonderful. Well, it's good to see you guys. We've been trying to do this for some time, but the Lord has worked it out, and the timing is good. And look at you. Hi. He's more interested in my tie. Well, at this time, let me just remind us, O oh, congregation, and remind these parents especially, that this moment is a very special moment. This is a sacrament, and it is a holy sign and seal of the covenant of grace. And so 
we remember this in the grace that Christ Jesus has ordained us to do this and has brought us to this place. Baptism is particularly a sign of welcome into the covenant community. That's not just us as a congregation. This is the universal church of Christ. But this baptism, just like your baptism, doesn't save you. It is the saving power of Jesus Christ in our lives that transforms our sinner's hearts into ones that have hearts of flesh, ones that respond to him and his word. So what we do here, congregation, is we bring about some vows from the parents to raise up their child in the, in the admonition of the Lord, and then we pray over him as we also bring forth the sacrament of baptism. But you, O congregation, have part of this as well, because we all together are going to be raising this child in the admonition of the Lord as a community. And that is part of the importance of this covenant sign and seal. All right. Grace and Philip, are you guys ready? Okay, you're more than ready, I can tell. So the questions that I present before you is your covenant promises to the Lord for your son. Do you acknowledge your child's need for the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ and the renewing grace of the Holy Spirit? Yes. Wonderful. Do you claim God's covenant promises and benefits for your child? And by faith, do you look to the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation for your child as you do your own? Yes. Wonderful. Do you unreservedly dedicate your child to God and do, do you promise to rely on God's power and grace through the Holy Spirit to live an exemplary life before your child? Yes. Wonderful. Do you commit yourself to pray with and for your child and to teach your child the scriptures and the great articles of the faith in Jesus Christ? Yes. Wonderful. Last question. Do you promise to use every means provided by God, including faithful participation in the life of the church, to bring your child to the loving discipline of the Lord? Yes. Wonderful. Well, brothers and sisters, you also have a part in this. And part of this is the responsibility of the promises that we make before the Lord and also the promises to this family and to little Reese here, who's looking up to the Lord already. <laughs> Do you... Members of this congregation acting for yourselves and in behalf of the whole body of Christ, assume responsibility with these parents to spiritually nurture this child. If so, say we will. We will. Praise God. Do you commit yourselves to set a godly example before this child to provide, as far as you are able, all that is necessary to the ends that this child may one day confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? If so, say we will. Amen. Amen. What is Reese's full name for this congregation? Reese Atlas Bullsman. Reese Atlas Bullsman. I, I was telling Philip, I said, that name, he's going to either be an archaeologist, like that, that's epic, or a great novelist. Or a spy. I don't know. That's, that's, a, that's a pretty epic name, you got to admit. <laughs> Reese. Hi, Reese. Hi. Reese Atlas Bullsman, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And may the blessings of Father Hunt. <laughs> oh, don't cry. May the <laughs> blessings of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, a new child of the covenant of God, Reese Atlas Bullsman. Let's all praise the Lord together. <laughs> Father, we pray your blessing, your hand upon him, your grace and your peace, that you, O oh Lord, would be the faithful one unto him. This water does not remove his sins, for they are still upon him. But you, O oh Lord, are the one who will one day call to his heart if his name be written in your book and all that his parents have promised will come true and the life of this congregation live before him and encouraging him in Christ that one day, O oh Lord, you will take him and he will be yours forever. Until then, Lord God, we pray all of the covenant promises upon him 
May your, your peace and your grace and your blessing and favor be upon him now and forever. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Okay, now I have one hand here, and I don't want to touch this with a wet hand, but I have a baptism certificate for you. There you go. Wonderful. Praise the Lord. Let's continue now. Children, come on up because Pastor Jim is ready to teach. Morning, everyone. We are talking about um, this next few weeks, talking about how to grow as a Christian. And I think it's very uh, appropriate that we're still thinking about baby Reese and how he was born and how he is going to grow up. And, and a lot of those kinds of things, you've seen it in your own families, right? You've seen little kids, little babies being born and then little kids growing bigger and bigger. And we're talking about that, but we're also talking about seeds and how they grow. Let's go to the, the slide there because we're going to say our Bible verse, okay? So we say the Bible reference and say the verse and then say the, the numbers again, all right? John 15, 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. John 15, 5. Go to the next one, please. We're talking about how seeds grow. And remember, I shared with you, I made kind of this giant seed, this giant grape seed to help us understand uh, what happens in a tiny, tiny little seed. Now, I'm taking that apart because I want us to, to think about what's going on inside the seed. Again, I, I realize this isn't a real seed, okay? So not to be confused. This is just pretend, but it's big. It's really big, so we can kind of see what happens. Now, if you notice, there's different parts of the seed. You can, those of you who can read can look at it up there. And we're going to talk a little bit more about those because each one of those has to grow in order for the seed to grow into grapes, all right? So it all has to grow. Now, if you notice, in the middle of this seed, there's something kind of all tangled up. And that's what we're going to especially be thinking about for these next couple weeks because this is, and that says it, a baby fruit, baby shoot, and baby root. All right, so there's a baby grapevine right there in the middle of this tiny, tiny little seed. God made that. That's how God grows things is it starts as you can't even hardly see it. It's so tiny. And then God does something to make it grow, which we're going to talk a little bit about. But as it's growing, if I can do this and make it work, what happens is this little thing sprouts up, and this little thing, oh, it's not going to go down, it goes down. The roots go down and get bigger and bigger, and the shoot goes up and gets bigger and comes up above the ground. And then there's fruit. And again, this is just pretend. But as soon as it starts getting tall, then there's going to be tiny, tiny little buds that will become one day the fruit, the grapes. That's the way God grows things. Now let's go to the next slide, because this is the same thing that God does with people. All right, I showed you last week a, a drawing of a baby in his mommy's tummy, all right? So this is kind of how babies grow. They start off really, they're all really tiny, really small, but they don't really look like a baby. In fact, before that first one, there's ones that don't even look like a baby, all right? They just look like a little blob, but that's still a baby. It's just a tiny, tiny little baby. It's like a seed. And that baby is going to be in his mommy's tummy for sometimes nine months. And it's just going to keep getting bigger and bigger. And it's more obvious that that's going to be a baby as it gets bigger. Now look up above that and you see that's the same thing God does with seeds. All right? So you can see the seed 
and then you can see that something starts to come out of that, a little sprout, the third one, then the roots start getting bigger, and it just, all of a sudden, then one day it pops up above the ground, and it, it's now we can tell that it is a growing little plant. But let's go to the next one. This is what is really important for us to understand because throughout our studies, we're gonna talk about not just growing babies and growing grapevines, but we're gonna be talking about how God grows people, how God grows Christians, all right? When we saw little Reese up here being set apart for the Lord uh, and being uh, set apart in the covenant of faith, then what we're anticipating, we're hoping, is that God grows his little spirit as well, not just his body, but his soul, so that he grows and bears much fruit as well. But the only way that happens, and this is what's important to understand, is that God grows it, all right? John 15, five said, apart from me, you can do nothing. Plants can't grow without God making them grow. Now, he's, he's kind of behind the scenes. We don't see him making it grow, but God is the one who's making it grow. And the same thing is true with babies. And the same thing is true with Christians. But how does God make it grow? Well, let's think about that. If you look at that drawing there, you see that there's a plant, but there's two things that have to happen in order for it to grow. There has to be sun and there has to be water, exactly. Now, let's talk about the sun, all right? So, boom, here's the sun, all right? So, <laughs> sunlight, what sunlight does is it warms the ground, and when that little seed is down in the ground, the sun actually makes it warm up because babies like to be warm and seeds like to be warm, and so the sun is necessary, but there's something else that's necessary, and that is it has to have water on it, okay? I'm not gonna pour real water on that, but we have to have water. And what water does is it makes the sprouts grow bigger and bigger. In fact, even before it sprouts up, the water from the rain or whatever, uh, from the irrigation system makes the seed disappear. It dissolves, uh, it rots away actually and called germination and then the seed knows it's time to grow. Now here's the thing for all of us to understand, adults as well as children, God, we need sun and water to grow spiritually as well. We don't have to have real sunshine, but we have to have the Son of God. We have to have Jesus to grow our faith as well. Little Reese needs Jesus to grow his faith. He needs mom and dad, he needs family, he needs the church, but he needs Jesus most of all. And that's true for every one of you, every one of us. We need Jesus to be our son and our reign so that we will grow and become like him. All right, let's stand together and pray. Father, we need to understand what it means that without you, we can do nothing. Without you, there'd be no world. Without you, there would be no trees and plants and, and uh, no families, no church. Without you, we can do nothing. And I just ask, Lord God, that you would help these children to understand, especially as they start into school and they'll eventually be going to colleges and they'll be hearing that we don't really need God anymore. And that's just so, so wrong. Without you, we, they, can do nothing. Thank you, Lord, for being there for us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. heads and let's continue to pray. Father, thank you that you grow us, that it is a work that comes from your hand. Salvation completely belongs to you, but so does our spiritual maturity and our growth in you. 
And so, Lord God, we just present our hearts before You this beautiful morning, asking You, O Lord, to not only look into our hearts and search those places within us, but also bring to our understanding our own sin against You. Those things that we have broken away from You and Your authority over us, Your commands to us on what it is to live and to be good. Lord, correct our hearts. Help us to confess to You right now where we have lied, where we have hurt one another, where we have envied, where we have boasted, all of these things that we even listened to this morning from Your very Word. And fill us instead, Lord, with the fruit of the Spirit, that love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control. Lord God, give us the faithfulness that comes from that fruit. And Lord, we pray that in this time this morning, as we draw near to Your table and as we listen to Your Word preached and proclaimed, may You speak to us, Holy Spirit, and renew our hearts, renew our minds, and strengthen us for the journey ahead. Grow us, no matter what the age, Lord, grow us spiritually in You. We pray also, Lord, that You would bless as we give our tithes and offerings in the basket. Lord, would You just bless all of the money that is brought to You because You have provided it. And so, Lord, we ask that all of this would be to Your glory and to Your purpose. And we thank You that we can participate in ministries around the world and we thank you, Lord, that these ministries reach in, even into Russia right now, into the area of Tumen specifically, to the Bible college that is there, Lord. And we pray for Jeff Bain and his family as they serve there. Lord, we also lift up to you, uh, we lift up to you Victoria. And we ask, Lord, that you would be with her and lead her and use her for your glory as she's there. With the PRC, the Pregnancy Resource Center that was established there, and how she just goes about sharing the gospel news and bringing those to Christ in your grace and in your power. And Lord, we just pray for them. We lift them up, especially in this time of turmoil. A time when maybe even the country itself would be divided over the war that is present. And Lord God, as we remember them and we lift them up and we ask for your blessing on their ministries, we also pray for the Ukraine. We pray, Lord, for a ceasing of hostilities. We pray that you would bring about peace there and that all of those who are victims of this war, that you, O oh God, have a purpose in all of this and we trust in you. And we pray for the church in that area and the surrounding areas that bring in those refugees and care for them and share the grace of Christ. We pray, Lord God, use us and continue to use us and these wonderful partnerships of your glory and your mission around the world to proclaim the good news, the grace and the salvation through Christ alone. To you be the glory. Amen. We've been moving forward to... <clears throat> not only the Lord's Supper at the conclusion of the sermon, but always seeking a closer walk with the Lord. The Jubilee singers will <clears throat> sing the tune for you, and as we go along, we have five short verses. Maybe you can pick up the tune as we go, uh, as we introduce the song to you. Oh, for a closer walk with God. Or another tune is, Oh, fire of God. <clears throat> another word for this song. <clears throat> Jesus 
cross and his word. O fire of God, come burn within, renew a holy passion, till Christ my deepest longing be, my never-failing morning congregation brothers and sisters will you turn with me to first corinthians chapter one verse 10 that's where we're going to be today as we're going through the letter of paul to the corinthian church And this is probably about 62 to 64 A.D., not too long before Paul himself would be martyred in Rome. But right now, as he writes, he's in Ephesus. And I made a mistake last week in saying that this was the first of the letters. In fact, if you look at chapter 5, verse 9, it's very clear that this is the second of his letters of four. So we have the second letter and we have the fourth letter, and we don't know what those other two letters were. But the Lord purposed that we would have these two letters to learn and to grow from, particularly in a church that is divided. And what does it mean to have a divided church? Uh, That's part of what we're looking at today, is restoring our fractured fellowship. And this is really the problem that was going on in Corinth. There had become so many different factions and so many different positions and so many different things that people were pursuing for various reasons that Paul had to address this. And obviously, he had to readdress this from his first letter. And as he addresses this to the Corinthian church, he desires that they would get out of what the world has given them for faith, especially in the influence of the world around them. 
And let's consider that influence. Here are some, some pictures of our opportunity, my wife and I, to see Corinth even just this past year. And part of what you can see up here in the hill, I think, is one of the biggest influences is this place where was the temple of Aphrodite. I talked about this a little bit last week as we began Paul's introduction. And Paul was saying to the church, I, 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 I miss you guys. I, I love you. I, I proclaim that I am a servant of the Lord and I thank God for you. And then he listed off the various things that he thanked God for them for, the genuineness of their salvation, the remembrance that they had learned about Christ Jesus, and they held fast to him. That was when he was there. And he was there for a year and a half, serving them. We see this in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 18. But an influence was on the culture by and large. An influence had affected the whole of the city and all of that region. You see, this was a primarily Gentile region where they worshiped many different gods, and Aphrodite at the top of this hill was one of them. So influ influential was her presence there that sailors would come from all over to spend all of their money up at the top of this temple with temple prostitutes. That was considered the worship that would happen there. You can see other parts of the rest of the city. This is the Roman baths right here. And over here is the, this is the top side of the Roman baths and other structures of other temples around there. This was the influence of the city. All around them was this pagan worship. All around them was these Gentile and very focused on hedonism throughout this whole city. In fact, to be called a Corinthian anywhere else, people were suggesting that you act lewdly, probably uh, very rudely, probably drunken, all of these other things was to play the part of the Corinthian. How would you like your city to be known for that? That would be pretty embarrassing, right? Well, what's even more embarrassing is those who've had the Apostle Paul come and preach to them and teach them a year and a half. He goes away for three years, and this is all he hears about, is how they're playing, in a lot of ways, the part of the Corinthian within the church. And so he addresses this specifically in verses 10 through 17, which we're going to look at today, dealing with fractured fellowship. So here's my question. Have you seen churches dissolve or break apart over some pretty outlandish things? In my own experience, I've seen churches divide over doctrine. I've seen churches divide over worship music. How often does that happen? I've seen them even divide over the color of the carpet. As new carpet is going to be installed in this particular church, it was a large church at the time. I mean, large for a very small city, 250 people in this church. And by the end, by the time that I came across this church, the, the pastor that shared this information with me said this all happened over, over the color of the carpet before he came. And that they were down to 20 people at that point. So, I looked up some other reasons, and Tom Rayner, if you know him, is very good about uh, pulling churches and bringing together information. And here are five of the reasons that some churches have broken apart. An argument over the appropriate length of the worship pastor's beard. That, was, uh, that, that brought the whole church apart right there. A fight over whether or not to build a children's playground or to use it for a cemetery. A dispute in the church because the Lord's Supper had cran grape juice instead of just grape juice. How about this? An argument on whether the church should allow deviled eggs at the, bar at the barbecues or the church meals. Rainer's comment was, it's okay as long as they also serve angel food cake. A disagreement over using the term potluck instead of pot blessing. I don't know which one of those sounds better. I liked Providence pot, but I guess that doesn't work either. Think of these things. As ridiculous, we might, we might laugh about it, but this is a serious matter. And in the Corinthian church, it was far more serious. These were, not, these were trivial things, but they were not what they were arguing about. They were arguing about Deep spiritual issues. Part of those issues is this. Part of these issues is this. 
It requires our commitment to unity. Well, that is part of what we're saying in, when we say it restores our fractured fellowship. What restores our fractured fellowship? It requires a commitment to unity. What unity is not for the church? Let me read these scriptures to you. Verse 10. I appeal to you, brothers, Paul is saying, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. Consider this together as we look. Consider this, that all of you agree and that you have no divisions among you. The first part is that we need to know this very word for divisions is used in the same sense and can be used for furrowing a, a field with a plow. So I bring, this, I bring this illustration up because Paul has it right in here. This, this divisions is that word that's used in the Greek to also mean just furrowing the ground, that you're separating the ground. You're making a separation between two different group, between one group to become two. And I was thinking about this. What it's not in the church is it's not a place, uniformity or being united, even though we're required to do this, does not mean that we're just cookie cutters. There was a great song uh, I loved in uh, the 1980s from Steve Taylor. Anybody remember Steve Taylor? The early Christian rock. Um, and he wrote a song called I Want to Be a Clone. And he, a part of the song was, I want to be a clone and kiss conviction goodbye. Cloneliness is next to godliness, right? He said, I think I know the way. Help, let me help share the way. So they said, oh, no, you're way too young. You've got to grow. Give it 20 years or so. Once you become one of us, then you can make one of them like us. And that whole idea that every Christian needs to look and act the same, that's not what unity is about. And this is what it is not in the church. It doesn't mean that we all look like clones of one another and we're all acting the same way, but instead we are bound to the Spirit of Christ and that we know Him and Him alone and we search out and seek Him. Unity is not an insistence on everyone having also the same opinion about everything. Look around even this church. We probably don't all share the opinions about everything the same. But the one thing that we're united on is who? Christ Jesus. Amen. It also means that we're not rallying around a, a structure or an organization. We're not, my denomination's the best. My church is the best. Look at our structure. Look at our organization. We got elders. We got deacons. We got people serving in open doors. That's what it's all about. We're united. Is that really what brings us together as a structure? No. It is something deeper. It is the fellowship, the friendship, and the believing that we are part of the body of Christ and the friendship in Christ. So I want us to consider that. That's what unity is not within the church. Well, it keeps going past me. What unity is to be in the church is just what he continues to say. But that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. Notice those two things that we're supposed to be united on. The same mind and the same judgment. So why do I have this net up here? Because the very same word that is used in the word unite is also used in Mark. It's used in Mark 119. And if you went and looked at 119 and saw that Greek word right in there, that uniting, it's the word that is used to mend a net and to make a net stronger. And that's what, he, that's what Jesus finds James and John doing in their, their dad's boat is they're mending, they're mending nets. And so the very idea for us is that here we are to be this one unit that has one purpose. And what is that one purpose? If we're fishers of men, a good big old strong net is the way to go. And so these fishermen, even as they're bringing together this net, it's a metaphor that Paul brings to them very clearly in this moment that being united is being knit together. Now, here's the int interesting thing about this word. It's passive. It's passive. This whole being united doesn't mean that we're mending things and we're fixing things and we, 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 and us, us, us. If it's a passive word and we're told to do this, 
Who, who does that imply is actually doing the work? It's the Lord. If we allow the Lord to mend us in our fellowship, if we allow the Lord to be the one who overcomes the little things that are different from us, that will be a blessing and that will help us. This is what, this is what being united is about. It's about this mending and this bringing back together in two different ways. First, the mind. A singular understanding of Christ Jesus in our mind. He is the singular understanding, the single thing that we look for. 1 Peter 3.8 said this, Finally, all of you have unity in mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, a humble mind. Imagine, brothers and sisters, if all of us had this towards one another, the world would clamor to be part of a community like that. To see God working to mend us together in these things that are forgotten in this world, like it was forgotten in the time of the Corinthians, to be sympathetic, to have brotherly love, to be tender-hearted, to be humble in mind. Philippians 2.2 2 says, Complete my joy by being of the same what? Mind. Having the same love, having in full accord of, no, of one mind. If our mind is all focused on Jesus Christ, if here he is upon the cross and all of our minds are looking to him and all of that we do and consider and think about is focused on him, what's it doing for us individually? Maybe here's you and here's me. What's it doing for us individually? It's bringing us together because he's our sole focus. He's our, he's our end reward. Having this mind of Christ Romans 2, or 12, 2, reminds us about what our mind should be like. Do not be conformed to this world. He could have been talking to the Corinthians, right? But be what? Transformed. Yes. Transformed by the renewing of your mind. That by testing, you may discern what the will of God is, what is good and acceptable and perfect. If we have our hearts stayed upon him, and this means in our time of daily reading individually, in our times of getting together and studying the Lord's word, in our times of worship, if we're focused on him, you know what, as we worship him together and declare his name, we are drawing each other together in love for one another. Because once you consider exactly what Christ has done for you and the forgiveness of your sins against the God of heaven, how hard is it for us to hold on to our grudges against one another. It really should be difficult. Well, that's also what in Philippians 2, 5, have this mind among yourselves, that which is in Christ Jesus. And so within that idea, this is also the filter, the lens by which, and that is the whole focus of our sermon series, living a life in the lens of the gospel Having that in mind, it draws us to better judgments. Wait, I'm going too far. Better judgments. It means that in part of being united is that our judgment is a singular purpose of conviction. What is to be considered real and true. When we make this judgment, we're saying, this is absolutely true in my life. This is absolutely true in the life of the church. This is what I should live and do in the world. And this is also how I can discern what is good and what is not and what is of God's will. It's all based around Christ. Am I saying that enough yet? Because this is kind of Paul's theme throughout this as he reminds this church, what have you forgotten you had conviction, you had love, but it seems like you've lost focus of who that love is all about. Unity is predicated on, king, on a kingdom way of doing relationships within God's new family. Psalm 133 reminds us even from far back the covenant community of God was to be in harmony with each other and also would have good judgments between them. Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in what? Unity. It is like the precious oil on the head running down the beard, on the beard of Aaron, 
running down the collar of his robes. Aaron, by the way, was the high priest, the first high priest serving the Lord in the temple or in the tabernacle with his brother Moses by his side. And it was that anointing, that, that anointing of setting him apart, that anointing on his head that runs down his beard and is, are good stains upon his collar. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing and life forevermore. This reminding that as we love one another, we are reminded of how much God has loved us and poured himself out for us. And so our judgment is to be upon those things that God has said is good and God has said is perfect and God has called us to. Now, I'm not saying that that's going to make you perfect or that's going to save you in any way. And it seems like they had kind of lost the mark on this as well. Now, I'd, I'm going to give you a quote, and the quote is from N.T. Wright. I don't want to uh, let you guys uh, think that I want you rushing out to buy N.T. Wright books. Uh, he's kind of gone off the rails with some of the things, in my personal opinion, uh, on the, uh, on, uh, about Paul and the new, uh, new perspectives of Paul. But he has some particularly important things to answer in this. Unity is anchored in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Unity is informed by the mind of Christ. And unity, unity and this is the very important part, unity is costly, complicated, and messy, but mandatory. Well, he's, he's coming to this idea, even as we read from uh, verse 11 to 13. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people, and that probably meant Chloe, who is uh, a, a rich woman who has probably had uh, a lot of the church at her home and sponsored many people. These were probably her servants or uh, fellows that, uh, that lived in her, uh, her household or belonged to her household. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. I like how he includes that, my brothers. What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were your baptisms in the name of Paul? I look at it like this. Part of it for us as we consider, the, consider what it is for us to have unity, it demands our commitment to Christ. And I would almost add to Christ alone in this. The problem is not that there is just quarreling. It's over what is going on in the quarreling and why the quarreling is taking place. Yes, there should be no fighting among us, right? That, that we should tamp that down. We should really give that to the Lord. But it is in the way that Paul describes what's going on here that gives us a deeper understanding that this quarreling and fighting, which is spoken about in Proverbs 20, verse 3, it is an honor for a man to keep aloof from strife, but every fool will be quarreling. To keep them from this very adage, and even a reminder to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2, 23, have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies you know that breeds what? Quarreling. If a fool says in his heart that there is no God, like is much declared in Psalms and Proverbs, then the Corinthians were on the cusp of even denying God over them in authority and priority. Why? It's because of the way they describe this. In the Greek, as he says, I follow Paul, and I follow Apollos, and I follow Cephas, and I follow Christ. The wording in the Greek, and this is the very strange part, the wording in the Greek, remember when Jesus says his I am statements? In the Greek, that's ego eimi, okay? I am. And then he'd say a shepherd, he'd say, you know, the way, the truth, the life, all of those different things. These people are saying, ego a me, Paul. Ego a me, Cephas. 
Ego me, Apollos. And the whole church was dividing in these sections of who they felt was the better apostle, the better teacher. But they were even saying, I'm team Paul, or I'm team Apollos. They were basically saying, I belong to this person. Some were so righteous as to say, I belong to Christ. But it was still, once again, this factioning that was happening and ripping the church apart as each one was following like for us, it would be like saying, I follow Sproul. And then somebody say, no, no, no. What you're really saying is, I belong to Sproul. I belong to Spurgeon. I belong to Luther. Where's Christ in that whole conversation? You might appreciate their teaching, the style, the way they even speak of somebody, their doctrine, their theology. You might love all that. But that's not going to save you. And in fact, if we let that even divide us and say, how could you like Sproul? Please. No way. He is, you, you can, doesn't even hold a candle to Calvin. Sproul would say so too. But it's that idea that they were factioning in such a way and breaking apart that it was actually dividing the whole community of the church. But here's the ironic part. Guess what was found regarding the temple of Aphrodite? A two-handed bowl that has inscripted on it, I belong to Aphrodite. You see what the Corinthians were doing? They were letting the outside world influence even their theological position within the church. Does this at all sound contemporary? <laughs> Do we see this? They were even saying, I am I am of Aphrodite. This whole idea of connection to the world, but now we're seeing it seep into the church, and you can almost hear Paul's weeping at having to even, even talk to them and appeal to them about this. Look at verse 10. I appeal to you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus. He's appealing all this to them, trying to correct them, trying to let them see how important this is. Because if factionalism has taken place in the church, how can we mend lest we have our minds transformed and be focused once again on Jesus Christ? Everyone, and look at what he says there, everyone in the church was doing this. What I mean is that each one of you says, can you imagine that for our body? How divisive that would be? And so he even goes on and says, well, what does it really mean? It doesn't mean to look only for those who are teaching and preaching. It doesn't mean that I just listen to their rhetorical style or I like their smile or uh, they're really simple to understand. It means that there's something deeper that needs to be pursued. And what is it that needs to be pursued? Well, that is what it means to have Christ as all that we have. When, when it is only Christ. It's not Paul. Paul even says, is Christ divided? No, he is one. He's using, using these rhetorical questions. Is Christ divided? Do you see him splitting himself apart in different ways? Maybe it's shame to us in some ways regarding our whole denominational attitudes. I'll, I'll tell you, yeah, yeah, I'm an EPC guy. I, I hold to the denomination. I've served the de denomination, but I'll tell you what. If there was no EPC, I'd still be serving Christ. It's not about our splitting apart even in those ways. Look at what they were doing. They were doing something deeper than just dividing over different theologies. They were actually identifying with the person as the person who was saving them or the person that they belonged to. So he, he asks, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Was Apollos crucified for you? Was Sproul crucified for you? Where is your loyalty and where is your focus? Because it should be Christ being all for you. Or were you baptized into the name of Paul? Just like we had Reese baptized today in the name of who? Jesus Christ, but Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The one name that Jesus gave us. The one name, notice I say Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Notice the Trinity there? The one name to which we are baptized. Because Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one God together forever. 
So what does he go on to after showing us and pointing to us that it is Christ? He is the one. He is not divided, but instead, He is the only Savior. And He is the only one who died for our sins. And He is the only one who, by whose name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we are baptized. Christ is all that we need for the forgiveness of our sins and the perfect sacrifice to God for those sins. Only baptism in His name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, God's name, will bring us to the community of faith. Will bring us, welcome us into this sign and seal and family relationship. Jesus Christ is our singular care for the church. He is in his perfect unity with God is also with us. Shows that he is one. And now we are one together with him. He unites us and he is the only one to whom we belong. No one else. So it is Christ alone. It demands our commitment to Christ and that means Christ is everything to us. And lastly, it focuses on our commitment to the gospel. Look at what Paul finishes by saying. I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one may say that they were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. Don't you like the little, doesn't that feel like a letter? Like, it's just like one of those spots. Okay, I remember Gaius. I remember Crispus. Okay, and by the way, these were two important people in in Corinth. Crispus was one of the rulers of the synagogue, and he became a believer. And also, Gaius is supposed to be uh, the other ruler of the synagogue. And so both of these men came to Christ. And then he's trying to think. He's going, okay, anybody else? Oh, I, I remember the household of Stephanus. Yeah. But other than that, I don't remember anybody else. And I like how he's turning to say, it wasn't about me in baptizing, because I think that would have been even more of a stumbling block for you guys. You go, oh, I was baptized by Paul. Did Apollos baptize anybody? That whole way to diffuse any pride and any boasting and any arrogance. And you guys are probably starting to get a whiff of that coming from the Corinthians, aren't you? that they were very much focused on themselves and serving, this, serving themselves in this way. But it's not about ba- baptism. Paul is pointing it away from that. And basically also pointing away from himself, but he's also pointing that it's not just about baptism. As we were even saying this morning, it doesn't save us, but it brings us in to the community family. For us is in the Reformed tradition, we hold to baptism being... Uh, the new covenant sign that parallels to the old covenant sign of circumcision. Only this one is shared for male and female alike. And this also announces that you're part of the covenant community. But what did it not ever do in the Old Testament? Did circumcision save any of those men? No. Because we find many of them breaking God's law and being judged by God in many of those circumstances. Does baptism save anyone? No, we only find that in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and the belief in him and that that sacrifice covers us by atoning for our sins. What I mean by that is that he paid for our sins. Instead of us dying, he died. And now he pleased the Father who would crush us under our sin because God is perfect and holy and has nothing to do with sin absolutely nothing. It's like dry wood and dry leaves next to a bonfire. How long is that not going to catch on fire? The closer you get it to the bonfire, the more likely what's going to happen? It's going to go up. That is our sin before God, and righteously so, because we have broken his commands. But he put all of that on Christ. And by doing so, it's not about just being entered into the covenant community. It's about the very fact that it is the cross and the cross alone that we hold to. For Christ did not send me to baptize, he says, but to preach the gospel. To preach the gospel. And not with words of eloquent wisdom. Who's he poking at? All the guys that you guys are looking to. 
Paul says, I, I didn't speak with eloquence. I didn't have all that stuff. All I spoke to you with was just plain words of Christ. And he reminds them of that again. Lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. He's saying it's not about a show. It's not about having all the eloquent words. It's not about the perfect rhetorical style. It's not about how the guy looks up front. But what it is about is it is about Christ. And it's about his gospel. And I, I want us to have the gospel clear in our heads. Okay, and, and here's just a, a, a clear way that I found. And it's just a few little points. Let me just read these to you. One, the gospel starts with creation. The story that doesn't start with us, but starts with God. Next is the fall. We botched it, not God. All right? In the fall, we decided that we had more wisdom than God, and we listened to the lies of the serpent. And our mother and father of ancient times, our first mother and father, ate of it, and with that breaking of the covenant, they fell. They fell from God's grace, but not for long. For even in that act of falling away, God gave promises. Promises of redemption, promises of salvation. And redemption is the next part. So we have creation, fall, and then redemption. God's act to save us and what we have broken. God's act to save us and what we've broken. And this he did throughout, beginning from the garden as he killed an animal and then clothed them before they went out naked into the world. And we look at that and we see that's God's grace covering them. That's God's grace taking care of them, even as where they were to go out. And from that first couple comes one son, one son of holiness, one son that God declared holy. And he believed God and he was set apart and his name was Abraham. And what happened with him is from him came a whole nation. One nation. And from that one nation came one man who would be of the nation and of God. This would be Jesus Christ himself. And through Jesus, through Jesus by faith, sin is forgiven because of his payment on the cross, his death and his resurrection. And also that perfect righteous life that he lived, he gave to us. So we've been forgiven of our sins and we've been declared righteous by God because we receive a righteousness from Jesus. So that means the last part is restoration. So we have creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. Now this is more like it. Restoration is where we are made right with God, and one day we will be with Him perfectly forever without sin present. Do I get an amen for that? Amen. That's our hope. That's our joy. That is, that is the very focus that our heart is upon Christ and Him alone, not our baptism. That's why I love this picture. I just saw this. Here's a man in water, but what is he holding on to clinging to the most is the cross of Christ. And for you and me, brothers and sisters, that is where we are to be. Consider this. It's just almost a pause in the warning that Paul is bringing up. He, you're going to notice this. He's going to bring up the problem, and then he's going to focus on the gospel. That's what he's going to do all throughout Corinthians. He's going to first bring up a problem, and then focus on what happens when you look through the gospel and how it fixes it. Let's pray. Lord, help us, even as we read through Corinthians, to prepare our hearts for what it means to look through the gospel's lens to see what our problems are and to see how you need to work in our lives to correct it, how you will knit us together in unity, how you will let all of those other things, fancy speakers, uh, our, our privilege over whether or not we want one person to teach us or another person, and we want it, all of that being forgotten, Lord, that our hearts are upon you and you alone. Focus our minds on this, Lord, that we wouldn't get distracted either by the world and what it says, but instead, Lord Jesus, that we would be with you and focus upon you and be about your gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. We come to a very important moment in our service to the Lord, but also in our joy before Christ. And this is an opportunity to share communion with one another and with the Lord.
During this time, it is not the elders that serve you. It is Christ our Lord who serves you. Serves you this meal of bread that represents his body. Serves you this wine that represents his blood. This is a meal for all of those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is for all of those who cry out to him for grace and forgiveness of sins. And this is a way to remember and taste and see that the Lord is good. Let's pray and let's prepare our hearts. Lord Jesus, help us in this moment to be examined by your Spirit. Search us, O Lord, and know our hearts. Know our trying minds. And if there be any wicked way within us, Lord, forgive us and cleanse us and make us new. Lord, I pray for all of those who are here today that perhaps don't know you, don't believe in you, haven't been called by you to faith and given trust in you alone for their salvation. I pray, Lord, that they would respect this meal and just let it pass, not bringing judgment on themselves. Lord, I pray for those who are still wrapped up in sin and not able to get out of it and not wanting to repent of it, Lord. I pray that they too would let this pass and let it be a reminder to them in their heart that they need to get right with you by yielding to you and your sovereignty, yielding to you and your grace and forgiveness and command to come and walk in righteousness. Lord, even if we have broken relationships here, let us take that, take that into mind as we shouldn't come to your table squabbling or quarreling with one another. Let us not dishonor this table. But let us instead, Lord God, right now receive from you a special grace as the bread is still just bread, but it represents your body. The juice is just still juice, but Lord God, it is your blood right now. Not because it changes in any way, but because you are spiritually making it so and giving us a special grace. We pray your blessing on this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Ask the elders to come up to help serve. If you are um, gluten-free, we do have these gluten-free ones that you can feel free to take. Got two hands. Lord God, bless us as we now receive and we now give our hearts once again to you, yielding to your truth and your love through the graciousness of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for serving us this meal. In Jesus' name, amen. You'll notice there is two different sides. Go ahead, brothers. There's two different sides. One has the juice and the other side has the bread. Feel free to open up just the, uh, just the bread part and hold it. And we'll all eat it together.
from our only hope, the Lord Jesus Christ. On the night that he was betrayed, he took bread. In the presence of his disciples, he broke it. He said, this is my body given for you. Take and eat. A little while later, in the Seder meal, celebrating the Passover, but now giving a brand new covenant to his people, he said, this is the cup of a new covenant. My blood shed for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink. His body, his blood, but most of all in this moment, His special grace to be with us and to be ever near as He always is and knitting us together as we focus on Christ. To God be the glory now and forever. Amen? Amen. 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 Thank you, brothers. As far as the east is from the west, remember this. So too has the Lord Jesus Christ removed your sins from you. Glory to God. From the letter of Jude, chapter 1, 24 through 25. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to make you stand in his presence. Together we sing. the grace and the peace and the unity of Jesus Christ draw us together now and forever for he has saved his people and he gathers his sheep and we are the sheep of his pastor to him be all the glory and praise now and forever and the congregation together said amen God bless you all